And we continue with our opening words. I keep coming back to Kathleen McTeague. I think I should write her a thank you note. <laughs> we come together this morning to remind one another to rest for a moment on the forming edges of our lives, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude, taking the time to look into one another's faces and see their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope is hallowed by our presence together. Today's prayer, We Give Thanks for the Animals, is written by Gary Kowalski. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. We give thanks for the animals who live close to nature, who remind us of the sanctities of birth and death, who do not trouble their lives with foreboding or grief, who let go each moment as it passes and accept each new one as it comes with serenity and grace. Enable us to walk in beauty as they do, at one with the turning seasons, welcoming the sunrise and at peace with the sunset. And as we hallow the memory of good friends now departed, who loved abundantly and in their time were loved, who freely gave us their affection and loyalty. Let us not be anxious for tomorrow, but ask only that kindness and gratitude fill our hearts day by day into the passing years. Amen. Called the blessing of the animals on St. Francis Day. You birds of the air, hawk, sparrow, and laughing jay, you embody freedom itself. Delight us with your song. Astound us with feats of migration. Grant us your perspective. For too often our horizon is limited and we are blind to the full results of our actions. You worms of the earth, ants, beetles, spiders, and centipedes, you are the essential but oft-forgotten strand in nature's web. Through you, the cycle is complete. Through you, new life arises from old. Remind us of our humility, for the wheel of life does not turn around us. We are not the axle, but merely spokes no less than unseen, unknown companions such as yourselves. You, creatures of the wood and field, marsh and desert, bear and bison, skunk and squirrel, weasel and wolf, too often we have sacrificed your homes in the name of progress, clear-cutting the forests to fill our desire or covering the earth with cement and suburban lawns. May we remember that the earth was not given for our needs alone. And what we do to you, we eventually do to ourselves. You animals of the farm, horse and cow, pig and fowl, willingly or not, you give your very lives for us your milk for our nourishment, your body for our sustenance. Yet too often we forget that the meat on our tables was once as alive as we are. Forgive our willful ignorance and remind us constantly to give thanks for your sacrifice. You dearest companions in our lives, dogs and cats, hamsters and goldfish, 
You who are with us today, and you who will always be present in our memories, you have enriched our lives in so many ways, endured our shortcomings with calm acceptance, taught us something of our humanity, taught us how to love. May we hold you in our hearts throughout the days of our lives. So I hope I don't get run out of town for this, but I have a confession to make. I'm not particularly an animal person. <laughs> I mean, I like animals okay. And if I'm completely honest with you, I frequently write my sermons with a cat on my lap, and this week on my shoulder. But I say I'm not really an animal person mostly because well, I just like people better. But rather than judging me on my lack of enthusiasm for animals, I'm hoping you might focus on the good news of this confession, which is that I like people. And that is, I think, a really good quality in a minister. <laughs> So I am a people person, but I know that many of you out there are animal people. And some of you rare folks are both people people and animal people. And some of you have been passing me notes on Sundays and in my box during the week saying, when are we going to have an animal blessing? And sometimes things like, you know, St. Mary's has a blessing of the animals. <laughs> when I get these notes, I feel something like my sister and brother-in-law did when they came upon their daughter, Callie, playing with a bowl with aging fruit in it. There was a fruit fly circling the bowl, and Callie was talking to it. When her parents moved to throw the culprit fruit away, Callie lunged to protect it and the fruit fly. Please, Daddy, she cried, don't throw it out. I just really want a pet. <laughs> when your child wants a pet so badly that she begins to play with a fruit fly, you know it is time to get a hamster. <laughs> And that is what my sister and brother-in-law did. A Chinese dwarf hamster who the kids named Zoe, which is somewhat confusing because they have a best friend also named Zoe. But with the addition of Zoe to my extended family, and having received a newspaper clipping about all of the churches who do animal blessings, and in honor of my cat at home, and in recognition that many of you have animal companions at home that mean the world to you, and in honor of the animal companions that are no longer with us, but whose memory keeps us a little warmer at night in that spot where they used to curl up beside us. This morning, we take part in a blessing of the animals. And in doing so, we join not only St. Mary's, <clears throat> but also people all over the world who on October 4th will be celebrating the feast day of the patron saint of animals, St. Francis of Assisi. Now, in deference to our historically appropriate carpet, and with a nod to my friends over at PETA, who remind religious pet owners every year that it can actually be pretty cruel and traumatizing to bring your animal to a crowded church with all those other animals. Our blessing of the animals will be done using pictures of our animal friends for the blessing and for our memorial altar. I don't think St. Francis would mind. Legends have left us with idyllic pictures of how beasts and birds were susceptible to St. Francis's charm and gentle ways. 
It said that the birds listened so reverently to his sermon along the road near Bavagna that Francis chided himself for not having thought to preach to them before. And one of the earliest legends of St. Francis speaks of a fierce wolf near the town of Gobbio who was eating animals and even humans because he was starving. The entire town was afraid to go outside the town walls until St. Francis, convincing the people that the wolf's hunger was what caused him to do wrong, met with the wolf, blessed it, and said, I promise that the town will feed you every day. I know that what you did, you did out of hunger. And the wolf offered St. Francis his paw as a sign. The town promised to do what the saint had bargained, and having adopted the wolf, fed him until the day he died. Last week, I was on vacation in New Hampshire. It's a dangerous thing to let your minister go on vacation mostly because it gives her time to read for pleasure. And you never know what is going to find its way into a sermon when you allow your minister time to read for pleasure. I spent many pleasant hours of my vacation reading Garrison Keillor's Life Among the Lutherans. Many of you know his wry sense of humor from A Prairie Home Companion. As I prepared my blessing of the animal service and thought about St. Francis of Assisi who loved all animals and who is often depicted with several birds perched on his shoulder, I read Keeler's story called Gospel Birds with particular interest. He says, it's been a quiet week here in Lake Wobegon. The highlight of the week was the performance at the Lake Wobegon Lutheran on Wednesday night of Ernie and Irma Lundine and their performing gospel birds. The deacons voted last summer to put on some Wednesday night programs because Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible reading have not been drawing well. Some nights only five or six people show up and if Pastor Inquis isn't one of them, they look at each other and think, well, what do we do now? And maybe they have silent prayer and just sit and read quietly to themselves for a while. Val Tollefson was the one who pushed the idea of programs, and he wrote to a Christian booking agency. And so, in the coming months ahead, our brother Flem Hospers, the world's tallest evangelist. And in February, the regional playoffs and scripture drill competition. And on Wednesday night, Ernie and Irma and the performing gospel birds. Pastor Inquis did not attend. He had pressing business elsewhere, wherever he could find it, I guess. <laughs> he said to everyone who asked, this was not my idea. This is Val Tollefson's idea. Ask Val about it. Now the Lutherans of Lake Wobegon are a dignified bunch. And to hear them talk after Sunday service, you wouldn't think anyone was going to see the birds. But as Wednesday night rolled around, people thought they might, if they had time, go up to the church and just see what it was. And of course, Wednesday night being the sort of night it is in Lake Wobegon, almost everyone did have time. And at 7.30, there they were in their seats, a little sheepish. And then Ernie and Irma walked out into the pulpit each of them covered with birds. Doves, canaries, parakeets, a couple of parrots, a crow. There must have been 40 birds perched on them. And all the birds were singing at the tops of their voices. It was awesome. It was wonderful. A symphony of birds, so beautiful. Then he bowed his head to pray and the birds were quiet not a peep. And it was a long prayer. Ernie prayed that all those who had come to mock 
would have their hearts opened to the message. That made people feel pretty small. The birds did some tricks, did some acrobatics, and walked a tightrope blindfolded. And the parrots talked scripture verses. And the canaries picked out a couple of hymns on a xylophone, which was nice. Ernie talked a while about the wayward life they had led in a circus for many years under the name the Flying Landinis. And meanwhile, Irma was dressed as all the other animals, walking two by two into the ark. And then from the back of the sanctuary, and who knows how it got back there, a dove swooped over their heads and circled the room three times. It descended on the ark, and the ark opened, and all the birds rose from it in a cloud. It was good. <laughs> then the birds took up the collection, <laughs> flew around, and took the dollar bills out of your fingers on the fly, and brought them forward. Pretty exciting stuff. And someone held up a 50 cent piece, and a parakeet took that, and lost altitude suddenly. <laughs> but somehow made it back to port. <laughs> it was a 45 minute program and absolutely memorable. Ernie and Irma talked about when they were children, which was sad. They were poor and they were lonely and that was how they came to love birds. Birds were so lovely and graceful and free. Ernie said that he sat and watched birds for hours, and then one day a bird landed on his shoulder, and he felt that it was God blessing him in some mysterious way that he could not understand but could only accept. And then Ernie said, and now to close our program, I'd like you to feel that same thrill I felt when the bird landed on my shoulder. I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed and all of us contemplate God's great love in our lives. And when the bird comes to you and lands on your shoulder, if you feel that special blessing in your heart, I'd ask you to stand at your seat. And now, he said, the blessing of the birds. The Lutherans of Lake Wobegon are a very reserved bunch, I'd have you know. And though they have often closed their eyes and meditated in church before, it lent a certain excitement to meditation to close your eyes knowing that a bird was about to land on you and wondering which one. Minutes passed in silence as people got down to the business of meditation and thoughts of divine providence came to mind, ways in which their lives had been supported and upheld by powerful love outside themselves, acts of love and kindness they had felt called to despite embarrassment. And more than that, a presence of grace in the world that is almost beyond your comprehension. And they heard a rush of wings as if angels were in the room. And one by one felt a light weight on their shoulders as if someone tapped them. And one by one stood, eyes closed, and felt not only touched by this, but filled somehow. They were stunned, especially the ones who had come to make fun of the performance. Something had happened. They weren't sure what, but something. Everyone agreed that it had been a mysterious experience. This morning, although we do not have birds to come and sit on our shoulders, we take some time to feel the blessing of gospel birds and of regular birds who come to the feeders outside our windows and to feel the blessing of our dog companions, of lap cats, of Chinese dwarf hamsters and pet turtles. And we take some time to bless them 
and remember them. We haven't done this before, but here's how I envision that it can go. I'm going to come down to the center aisle. If you have a picture of your pet, your current pet, bring the photo up and I will take a moment to bless your animal. And you can take that photo back with you to your seat. If you have brought pictures of pets that have passed on and are no longer with us, I invite you to come down the right-hand aisle to our pet memorial altar. Pastor Brenda and Lawrence will be there to help you add your photo to our pet memorial altar. And if you don't have a picture of your pets, current or past pets, we have some paw prints and feathers and fish cutouts over here at this table to the left of the pulpit. And you can come and write the name of your pet on that and I can bless that or you can add that to our memorial altar. And if you are not an animal person, you can just sit and add your blessings to those of us who are. Let's try it. Thank you. In New Hampshire, Lisa and I went hiking we challenged ourselves to hike up Lafayette as far as the Greenleaf Hut. We didn't realize quite how challenging it was going to be. And though the way up was the hardest, the way down was long, very long, longer than we remembered going up. And we were tired now and sore. About halfway down the mountain, I sensed more than heard a presence behind me. And I turned around to find a beautiful yellow dog quietly following me. At first, I worried that she was going to trip me up, get under feet. It was slow going over the craggy rocks and roots and I was being very careful. But she didn't trip me up. She kept a few feet behind me, gracefully maneuvering along the trail. She was obviously an accomplished hiker, but she didn't hold it over me at all. She didn't rush me or push past me. She just kept me company for a bit, distracting me from the pain in my legs. About 20 minutes later, we took a little break, and her owner caught up with us. He'd had knee surgery a few months ago, we learned, and was taking it slow. Should you be doing this, I asked. And he admitted that he shouldn't. I sure do like your dog, I said. And I meant it. She was an English lab and so sweet and not scary at all, just gentle and such a good hiker. She's my best friend, said the man. And I think he maybe even teared up a bit. If you ask me, he was thinking about his yellow dog and how he has been supported and upheld by powerful love outside himself. Acts of love and kindness and more than that, a presence of grace in the world that is almost beyond our comprehension. Almost, but not quite, because we have known the company and the love of animals. We offer today our blessing of the animals, but we have already been blessed by them. Amen, and blessed be.